Thank you, Barry, for those readings. So whether or not you have read or have seen all the movies in the Harry Potter series, you're probably familiar with what the story is about. A young man, Harry Potter, who finds that he is not only a wizard and not a mere mortal or muggle, as they're called, but he's also smack dab in the middle between this cosmic war between good and evil. And so one of Harry's mentors in the book is the greatest wizard that has ever lived, Albus Dumbledore. And so Dumbledore kind of watches out for Harry and the others all through the seven volumes of this book. Dumbledore is wise. Dumbledore is competent. Dumbledore is powerful. Dumbledore is, if we will, spiritually mature. And yet, in the last few pages of the seventh volume of Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the, the Deathly Hallows, Dumbledore and Harry are having a conversation right before the final battle. Things aren't looking great. And Dumbledore is kind of unloading himself on Harry and basically saying, man, I have made a mess out of everything. I'm no better than Voldemort, who's the, the lead character of the, of the dark side. And he says to Harry, you can't revile me any more than I revile myself. And so Harry finds himself in this odd situation of, of having to talk up his mentor, how odd it was, he says, to sit here and defend Dumbledore from himself. It was a great reminder for me that no matter how far along this journey we are, no matter how much we've practiced, no matter how deep we have gone in our own self-work, I don't think we ever fully escape the trap of shame and the trap of perfection. This week, the guidepost to wholehearted living that we're looking at is letting go of perfectionism and embracing, cultivating self-care, compassionate self-care. And I know, even, even as I was working on this this week, we kind of think, you know, we, we know that. And yet, even though we know it, it raises its ugly head all the time. We manage to tamp it down, but there seems to be always right around the corner that voice that tells us you're not good enough. That voice that tells us you've messed everything up. We see that in this story that, that Barry read for us this morning, that, that voice of condemnation from the outside as the people brought the woman that was caught in adultery to Jesus. And the interaction between those groups and Jesus ending up with, who is it that condemns you? Implying that there is no one left that condemns her. And certainly not Jesus. 
Do you notice that in the Gospels and the stories that, that were told of Jesus' interactions with people? Jesus never condemns them. Now, Jesus condemns systems and reserves an angry word for those systems that would, that would seek to condemn others, that would seek to let people know that they are not enough. But Jesus doesn't condemn people. So how did we move from the one whose name we claim that doesn't condemn to a system of religion that so often condemns the other. A system, there's a side note, that seems to be obsessed with what we do with our sexual lives, and Jesus never goes there. And yet we realize that this voice is a part of our life. It's a, it's a part of our existence. We see it in the life of Paul. So Paul, who had this dramatic conversion experience and comes to Jesus, but he had spent his previous life persecuting Christians. And he talks about how in the book of Acts that, that he had even held the clothes and guarded the belongings of the people that stoned Stephen to death. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, you know what, I just don't get this. The, the good that I do want to do, I don't do. And the stuff that I don't want to do, I do. What is the solution? I think it's interesting in Paul's wanderings, that he never beats up on himself. He admits to what he has done. He recognizes the struggles that he has. And yet he doesn't beat himself up. In fact, in Philippians, a book that's attributed to Paul, he writes, think on these things, the things that are pure, the things that are joyful. He says later in Colossians, you know what? I don't even judge myself. And yet we so often find ourselves in that place of, of judging ourselves and feeling that shame. And maybe you think, well, well, I don't feel shame. But think about some of these. These are from Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection, these shame gremlins that get in our way. Have you ever had these thoughts? What will people think? You can't really love yourself yet. You're not pretty, skinny, talented, successful, rich, happy, smart enough. No one can find out about blank. I'm going to pretend that everything is okay. I can change to fit in if I have to. Who do you think you are to put your thoughts, your art, your ideas, your music, your writing out into the world? Taking care of them is more important than taking care of me. Have any of those voices popped up in your head at any time? And so here's the thing about that. Here's why that self-criticism, that, that need for perfectionism is so detrimental. It keeps us isolated. So, so often we think that we're the only ones that are hearing that, that we're the only ones that are experiencing that. So we go hide among the props like little Esperanza did. The spiritual life, according to those that think and write about it, is the love of beauty. Dallas Willard, who wrote The Divine Conspiracy, said that spiritual formation is to help people love what is lovely and helping them place their minds on the lovely things. If we're beating ourselves up, we can't be in that place. It's that voice of criticism instead of that, that voice of compassion. 
it separates us from others. It separates us from God when we start to think that we have to meet certain standards in order to be accepted by God, in order to be, quote, spiritual. And it affects what we do. Dumbledore realizes, and the reader realizes, looking back over the past seven volumes, that that self-loathing that we're let into at the very end has colored the way that Dumbledore interacts with others and his ability to be able to trust others and how he even interrelated with Harry himself. It cuts us off. James Wilhoyt has written a wonderful journal article, and there's a post to it on the website if you want to delve into it further. But he talks about self-compassion as a Christian spiritual practice. Now we talk about spiritual practices all the time and kind of like a broken record about meditation and journal writing and walking a labyrinth and all those things. But he says that, that, that self-compassion is a spiritual practice. Dallard Willard describes the spiritual practices, activities of mind and body purposefully undertaken to bring our personality and total being into effective cooperation with the divine order. Another writer, Evan Howard, gets a little bit more specific, and he talks about the act or habit of intentionally... Oh, I lost my place. the actor habit of intentionally constraining one's own human experience in the context of God's active presence to achieve spiritual ends. So this place that we put ourselves, that walking humbly part of Micah 6.8, where we're not so wrapped up in ourselves, in our need for perfection, as we are, is embracing the rest of life, God, and everyone around us. And I find it interesting that both James Wilhoyt and Brene Brown in The Gifts of Imperfection turn to the work of Dr. Christian, Kristen Neff, who has given her whole career to studying self-compassion. And so a spiritual practice that's derived from Kristen's work. So when we start to hear those voices, when there's something that we've screwed up, then we have a, a practice we can maintain. And, and three things that are a part of that. Mindfulness. And mindfulness in this case is just a third person awareness of who we are. So, so often we hear that voice of criticism, that voice that narrates our life, and we think that that is ourselves, and it's not. So being mindful of that voice, treating ourself warmly, treating ourself with compassion, and then realizing our connection with the rest of humanity. So when we start to feel that, that need to perform or that sense of shame, here's a suggestion for a practice. Saying to ourself, slowly, this is a moment of suffering. So just recognizing that, that's the, that's the mindfulness part. So instead of automatically getting all the way pulled down into it, stopping and recognizing this is a moment of suffering. And then to mention to ourselves, suffering is a part of living. So recognizing it and then realizing this is a part of life. And so what that does is it connects us with the rest of humanity. It reminds me that I am not alone in feeling this way. P. 
people feel this way. It's a part of life. And then to remind ourselves, may I be compassionate. May I be kind to myself. That is self-kindness. And sometimes we're in that place, we can't muster those words to ourselves. So maybe it's a matter of imagining what would a friend say to us that knows all of our history, that knows all about us, what would they say to us in this situation? Or what would we say to someone for whom we care in this situation? As the story this morning reminded us, it's so much easier sometimes, isn't it? To be kind to someone else or to be kind to a pet than it is to be kind to ourselves. And here's what happens as we do that. We start to break off the shackles of that voice that's driving us to perfection, that's causing that shame, that's, that's always criticizing us and opens us up to connecting with the beauty around us, the people around us, and the God around us. Let's pray together.